This month on Community, we are celebrating Hispanic heritage. I'm Pete Gallivan. I'm Claudine Ewing. This month on Community, pioneers of change, sharing the future together. That is the theme of Hispanic Heritage Month, and no place is that theme more evident than just down Niagara Street. And we begin this month with an update on the Hispanic Heritage Cultural Institute here on Niagara Street. And joining us is the man with the plan, <laughs> Kaz Rodriguez. Hello. Thank you. Thank you very much for being in our community. You, you never left it, but uh, you know, for this special occasion, we really appreciate that. We were here about a year ago, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Give us an update. Where do we stand today? I mean, construction's underway and, and looks like the foundation is laid. The foundation is completed, you know? And uh, first and foremost, I gotta thank, you know, all our funding agencies, government, private, public, business, corporations, everyone that really helped, uh, you know, this project to this point. You know, but uh, as um, everyone knows and the community has been asking, the foundation is complete. Uh, we're ready to go to our next phase, which is the core and the shell of the project. You know, we have already uh, gone through the process of pre-bidding, okay? And we're very anxious to see those numbers when they come back so that we can continue our fundraising and complete this project that the community wants and uh, are inspired to see. How much money do you need? Well, we need $8 million. And how much do you have? $18.5 million. And so you're hoping those funders will come forward and, and pour into something that is needed and necessary. Absolutely. You know, this is, this is a community project, and it's something that the community needs. You know, I, I was born and raised in Western New York. I grew up in this neighborhood, and, and I know what this community needs as it relates to arts and culture. And this institute, you know, the entire uh, uh, placeholders within the institute are all uh, elements that the community needs. You know, we're gonna have a museum to be able to exhibit and preserve our history. An art gallery where we'll be able to, you know, exhibit many of the arts from our local artists and national artists. We're gonna have a theater, a theater where We'll be able to have performances, lectures, conferences, you know, anything that's educational, you know. The second floor will be learning labs for the children, a media center, which, you know, uh, we're, we're appealing to WGRZ to be a partner, a media center for radio and TV production. You know, uh, we want that to be an incubator for our high school students so that they can come in and get a taste and a feel for what it is to be in the field of journalism, get behind a camera, get behind a microphone, you know, do their own uh, program and what have you. And on the third floor, an activities hall where we'll be able to celebrate our birthdays and our community quinceañeras and, uh, you know, have activities for the community and a commercial kitchen, a culinary program, commercial kitchen where we'll be able to have uh, cooking classes, you know, uh, and... Uh, Nothing like cultural food. Well, you know, we're very connected to cultural food and, and spicy food, but by the same token, you know, we need to help our community eat healthier, nutritious, and that's why Goya Foods has been able to sponsor the culinary kitchen. This is all great. We thank you so much for coming on Community. Gracias. Muchas gracias y de nada. It's so cool to be on Niagara Street to see all the development and the celebration of Hispanic heritage. Yeah, and you never know who's going to come up and talk to you. Robert, <laughs> Robert Quintana from Niagara Cafe. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, it, to, for us, it's very exciting, not just Hispanic Heritage Month, but, but every time um, we're in our business at the Niagara Cafe and people come in from all walks of life, from Chitawaga to Orchard Park to Springville to East Aurora, and they come in and you know the old adage that you get to a man through his stomach? Well, we get through other community groups through our food and we teach them about our culture. And it's, and it's just, and it's, it's so exciting to see other ethnic groups come in through there and say, we love your food, but we love your culture. Yeah, we had to learn it on the streets. We grew up in Allentown together. <laughs> yes. And I, hey, hey, try this Goya malt beverage. I'm like, uh, yeah, exactly. No. Malt hey, what is that? Is it a papaya? Oh, yeah, I'll try that. <laughs> yeah. And it still comes in a bottle that looks like a beer bottle. Exactly. So we tell people, don't drive and drink your malta because the police <laughs> will think you're drinking and driving. That's right. And it's still, 
an acquired taste, we'll say. It is an acquired taste. It's a malt beverage type syrup. Yeah. But we start to give it to our kids when they're as little as two or three years old. And yep. by the time they're teenagers, they love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All so right. Thanks so much for stopping by community. Uh, in your community. Oh, thank you for being in our community. We love it. Thank you for celebrating us. <laughs> Farimpi, una de las cosas que están planeando es para tener un radio y noticiero de televisión adentro del Instituto Cultural de Gerencia Hispana. Mientras que eso está en proceso, yo tuve en el adelanto lo que ya tienen un radio aquí dedicado a las voces latinos. One thing that they're working on is to get a new TV station and a radio station inside the Hispanic Heritage Cultural Center. Now, while that's in the works, I already got a sneak peek of the new radio station era that's already dedicated to uplifting these Latino voices. This is the introduction you'll hear when you tune in to Radio Bilingue on 88.7 WBFO from a radio station based in this office building. Hello and welcome to Sin Fronteras. My name is Lorenzo Rodriguez and I'm joined today by a person who I think I'm gonna learn a lot from myself. Cash Rodriguez and Lorenzo Rodriguez are the weekly hosts Progress who are passionate about this type of work. I'm from South Florida, there's always, there's always been a presence in the media, Hispanic presence in the media down there. There's Univision, there's Telemundo, there's a number of other um, stations, but uh, when I got here, I realized there wasn't, there's a local affiliates and that's great, but then that, that specific attention to our culture, to our stories, to our way of life, like that wasn't, that wasn't there. Just a way of life in a pictures, language familiar uh, to an it, estimated it, it, 64 so, so million so Hispanic Americans from Southern Ontario to the Southern tier. From people on Niagara Street, on, out on the, on the west side, or anywhere on, on Grand Island. There are some Hispanics on Grand Island, I can assure you of that. They offer more than just music. As we call it, la noticias que nos importa. Wellness advice. Which of these labels has less sugar, higher protein, higher fiber? And that to me is like a winning. And you'll hear directly from local Latino voices. So we've always had asylum seekers. We've never really had the issue that we've had last year, earlier this year. I asked those personal questions just to get, not the pol political answers, but to get to get the, the human, the person behind the, the role and the title. Hispanic leaders and issues that are most important to their Spanish speakers. Immigration. We've been surrounded by that topic for forever. A dedication to Latino voices here in Western New York. I like that. After that better, hasn't been showed We can't complain. Enough. We just have to continue going. My goal is always to hopefully educate, enlighten, and, and, and entertain. I'm not gonna lie. That's the the perfect Venn diagram. Last year, first full year at the helm. What did you learn last year? Oh, that's <laughs> out of the way, yeah. What did you learn last year that you're taking into this year? Oh boy, you know, um, last year was a whirlwind. Mm -hmm. It really was a whirlwind. Uh, we were experiencing busing issues, if you remember, that was a, a right. big part of our conversation. We implemented a three-tier bell schedule, which was real innovative, you know, it was really out of the box. And what I'm most excited about is that we can implement our after school programs again for all children. So that's exciting for me. So, you know, it's almost like there's always a tale of two cities because last year we also had a $90 million deficit right. that we had to deal with um, due to the ending of the ARP ESSER funds. And so, um, you know, that was a challenge. That was quite something. But the way that we handled it is that we got ahead of it. And we wanted to let everyone know early on what we were facing. Um, we engaged, again, the community. And I even went out and did a little student tour because, you know, that's the group that nobody ever asked, you know, what do you think? What's really important in your schools that you need to keep? You ask the question and the kids have answers. Really? Kids and, have oh, answers? Oh, yeah. Kids will talk? <laughs> oh, yeah. Kids yeah. will talk if we listen, if yeah. we listen. Um, and so we were able to do that, prioritizing some of the things that I've said since day one would be priorities, priorities for me, like security. So we didn't lose any of our security staff. Um, 
We didn't lose any of our student support staff because we know that our children need people to talk to in schools. So that was another, you know, a little bit of a challenge. Um, I'm just trying to think of some of the things that, you know, we experienced last year. Uh, the board entered into an agreement with a group called the Council of Great City Schools. And they set these goals for the school district, for ELA and for math. And I've been pretty transparent that I want all of our third graders leaving third grade reading on grade level. It's really important because up to third grade, you're really learning to read. Yep. But after third grade, you're reading to learn. And so you gotta be able to read. And I know that down the line, that's gonna help us with graduation rates and all of those things. So that's a really important grade. Well, she has got a big job ahead of her for sure. Thank you very much to Dr. Williams Knight for sitting down and talking with me. Coming up next on Community, we're gonna look at something that many people either know about or they don't know about, it's sickle cell. All right, welcome back to Community, and right now we're gonna celebrate the cultural center of our community. We're gonna go inside of Shea's Performing Arts Center where they are recognizing those who have done some wonderful things in the arts world locally as well as nationally. The 2024 Western New York Entertainment Hall of Fame, Patrick Fagan served as president of Shea's for 16 years, and he led a $16 million stage expansion. There was a demand to restore this building, to build the stage house, get Phantom here, and it all worked out perfectly. But again, you have to remember, you gotta take that first step, which is forward, and don't be afraid. Stephen McKinley Henderson. Well, Claudine, I, I tell you, um, this is really where my career came together. I had been working cross country and everything, but in, um, I think it was 1981, came to Buffalo, and I, I found an autistic home. The Tony nominee has appeared in Oscar-nominated films, Lincoln and Fences with Denzel. Working with Dee was wonderful, but, uh, and August Wilson. The joy is to have done what I love to do and have it appreciated. Albert Nacholino, a pioneer in the industry who earned Tony Awards, and he knew how to connect with audiences. When you think about the arts in Buffalo, where do you see it in 20 years? Oh, I, I see it going, growing even more. The audiences keep growing. Uh, I like to say that what we do helps generate and bring new audiences to the theater who then go out and see other shows. Lorna Hill, actor, playwright, director, and founder of Ujima Theater Company. She died in 2020. She had a dream for her people, if you will, for her community, for her beloved community, as she will call it. And um, I think moments like this are the thing that elevate that feeling that we can't do this without each other. Juanita McLean was only a few months old when she had her first sickle cell crisis. Sickle cell disease is a group of inherited blood disorders that causes abnormalities in red blood cells. According to the CDC, the disease affects about 100,000 people in the United States, and more than 90% are African American, and an estimated 3 to 9% are Hispanic or Latino. In addition to her work with the nonprofit, McLean is an educator who continues to persevere after losing her gallbladder and navigating life with a dysfunctional spleen. I still get up every day and I stay encouraged and I stay um, just doing my best no matter what. Even days when I'm in pain, um, I still have to keep going and still just be who I am every day, um, and that's an advocate, a mother and a teacher. She is so resourceful and the group is so resourceful that um, it's helped us with Drew as he's starting to transition to adulthood. Melanie Agahue is a caretaker of her son, Drew. He's a senior in high school. I can't believe it because just it seems like yesterday I got the call that he had sickle cell disease um, and that was at two weeks old. Agahue says with sickle cell warriors, she's not alone. Other parents are helping their kids try to live a normal life as well. Mother and daughter Sonia and Mariah Williams say it hasn't been an easy journey, adding Mariah has endured multiple life or death situations. The number of physicians that she has to see, the providers, the super, um, the specialists, it's a long list. Like it literally is a full-time job just to manage her health care um, and all the complications that she suffers. Mariah Williams says monthly meetings with other sickle cell warriors are making a difference. 
Agahue says she's learned about essential resources. There are doctors to be in contact with and other organizations that support and donate. And it's just really a lovely community. Tuckasso Warriors has gotten us in contact with pharmaceutical companies, so we know what's up and you know what's on the horizon um, as far as you know different um, medicines. Really, what's important is having a big community, um, a supporters, family who can understand what you're going through, um, aren't judgmental. Um, and just kind of wa help walk you through the tough parts of life and make the darker days seem a little brighter. September is Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month. For Punt, they held a wine pairing gala. It raises money for six programs of the Punt Pediatric Collaborative. They bring a gift of life to dark circumstances, families dealing with pediatric cancer, and those who have faced loss. Dawson Knox is the organization's game changer and MVP. I fell in love with them after I took a hospital visit um, to the children's hospital to meet some of the kids and the families. Um, several years ago, my family had a very scary run in with uh, childhood cancer. Um, and I just saw firsthand how cancer can just bring a family to its knees, no matter if you're in a great situation or um, if you're already struggling to begin with. God's blessed me with this. Um, ability to play professional football and I think that's such a fleeting thing that's not going to last long at all and it truly doesn't matter um, but to be able to use that platform to give back to others to love on other people to bless other people um, I believe that's what we're called to do so I try to do that to the best of my ability Coming up next on Community. We're sitting down with Bishop Michael Curry. None of us are perfect. None of us are angels in human disguise. He's no nonsense. Sometimes the truth is really helpful. It may hurt before it helps. Faith a must. If you're a person of faith, your faith must inform your life. He preaches the way of love. And you dare to be people of love. Amen. Bishop Michael Curry's position as presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church has a mandatory retirement age of 72. He's retiring this year. I can't not serve in some ways. I don't have to, I don't have to lead anything, any, you know. I don't have to be a leader, um, but I want to serve. And this is in his future. I'm going to get a dog. While visiting Chautauqua Institution, we talked about his illustrious career. He's been before world dignitaries, and a request from the Archbishop of Canterbury led to him presiding over a royal wedding. In the course of their conversations about getting married and their premarital work, they kind of talked about what they were hoping for in the service, that they hoped that it would be representative of everyone. Who can forget? Imagine this tired old world when love is, is the way, when, when love is the way, unselfish, sacrificial, redemptive, when love is the way. In a marriage of two people is, um, it's an incredible blessing, but it's not easy. Do you still stay in touch with them? The answer is periodically we're in touch with each other. As his nine-year term ends, we talked about religion at a time when many Catholic churches are closing or merging. Why are people not going to church? Organized religion um, is in decline in America. The deep hunger for a relationship with that which is greater than the self, which ultimately leads you to a quest for God. That quest has not stopped. And he's a realist. Do you think uh, being inclusive is more important to preach now so that people mm -hmm. feel that they're wanted, that they are invited? Mm -hmm. Saying that love of God and love of neighbor, um, on these two hang all the law and the prophets, that's saying that's God's constitution. If that's what God said we're supposed to be about, that's not Michael Curry. If that's what God says we're supposed to be about, 
then not only our churches must be a house of prayer for all people, um, but our world mm -hmm. must be a house for all people. Ordained in 1978, Bishop Curry is known for being dynamic. I didn't learn to preach in a seminary. I learned to speak in public, in church, yeah. in school, <laughs> in Buffalo, New York. The Hutch Tech grad who remains close to his Buffalo friends awesome. from childhood. I remember those days at Hutch Tech. Curry grew up in a Buffalo neighborhood where a mass shooting happened at a grocery store. Did that just rock your world too to know that uh, a self-proclaimed white supremacist came to the neighborhood that you grew up in to kill people that look like you? It, um... One of the toughest parts of the time that I've been bishop has been walking with, with others who have been through that kind of tragedy that was not necessary. Hatred kills, bigotry kills, negativity kills, and, and people get hurt. Everybody is a child of God. How do you help heal and give people hope? You almost have to acknowledge something's wrong. And you gotta name it. Call I mean, it out. Call it out, sure. So then the next question is... A documentary inspired by his ministry will be streamed this fall. It's called A Case for Love. Love doesn't have a thing to do with whether you're red or blue. And we couldn't end our discussion without addressing the team. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan. I will be to the day I die. <laughs> and I can't wait to see them win the Super Bowl. Did he say that? And I can't wait to see them win the Super Bowl. But even if they didn't, what they did at the top shooting, what that team did, choose love, that was the Super Bowl of life. Well, I can tell you, Bishop Curry is one interesting person, and we wish him all the best in his retirement. Absolutely. We want to turn the page now and talk about music. Yeah, local music and some of the greatest names that are going into the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame. In October, the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame will induct the class of 2024. Here are their names. It is a well-rounded group of musicians and individuals who have talent, They've impacted Western New York and the world with their talents. And there's a lot of sacrifices. You know, this is the, this doesn't come with a 40-hour week. This is a you know 80-hour week or 100-hour week lifestyle. And and it's and it's uh, I'm blessed every day that I get an opportunity to walk through the doors here and and have a job. Rashawn Odell. Well, I started sneaking into my dad's studio. <laughs> Grandmother introduced me into to Liberace. My dad introduced me to like everything else, violin, uh, played drums, and uh, you know my dad took me out actually, and I started playing drum gigs with, and uh, on a professional level. A bass player with a list of accolades. What does it mean to you when you pick up the bass? Um, when I pick up the bass. It's like nothing else. It's just, I don't have to think about anything. It just happens. Um, so whatever I think, whatever I feel, it comes right through the instrument. You give whatever kind of energy you give to me, I can put it out. Phil Perry told me one time, he said, don't think too hard. It's just music. I know a lot of people that were exposed to music, but they had to work for it. Sometimes it's just a natural thing. Uh, for me, it just came natural. Like, I still have to practice. Sometimes you look at your hands and it's like, this is what I want you to do, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, but you haven't touched me in a while, so. Support local music. You know, we need it, you need it. And like we do all the time, a little music to close the show, right? Have to do it. And we want to thank you so much for joining us on Community as we celebrated Hispanic Heritage Month, something important, something we all should recognize. We'll see you next month.